Word. Welcome to our May oh. annual membership meeting. We're excited you are here and we have a lot to share. I'm really pretty excited about this uh, agenda. So we've got some pretty big announcements, um, both here at the coalition, but also pertaining to our sector and the work we do in our community. We're gonna talk a little bit about membership in a way that we haven't always done so with y'all. We have new board of directors um, for the coalition that we're gonna introduce you to and some renewing um, candidates. And then we've got an amazing legislative wrap up with big, big, big wins to share and getting excited for the work ahead of us. And, um, and then we'll have some uh, member announcements. So um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. I know folks have been doing that. I hope you got a little bit of your doo-wop on. I really had a hard time not singing to you all, so you're welcome. Uh, we love to see faces um, and have you on camera. You will not be included in the recording just by being on camera, but you will be included in the recording if you come off of mute. So just... Um, be aware of that. And if you want to stay out of the recording, throw things into the chat, we'll grab them out of the chat. Uh, we um, have closed captioning available. Someone might have already actually um, engaged it if that is helpful for you. All this will be up on our website, including all of the materials that you see today in the um, presentation. If we have media on the call, which we sometimes do, we love that. This is a public uh, space, but we do ask that you really only pull quotes from either coalition staff or our official presenters. And if you need to get in touch with anybody, just reach out to coalition staff. We're happy to connect you to the right folks at that agency. So I am going to ask if someone would be willing to um, read our mission, vision, and value statement. Sure, I'll read it. Thank you, Nancy. Our mission, uh, we mobilize our community to challenge systemic causes of homelessness and advocate for housing justice. Our vision, a region that acts on shared, a shared sense of responsibility to ensure that everyone has a home and our values are equity, justice, and collective action. Thank you kindly, appreciate it. I am going to turn it over to Allison Isinger, our beloved and wonderful leader, for um, to kick us off. So, Allison, take it away. Thank you very much. Good morning, and welcome to friends, long time and new, and members, long time and renewing. And if you are not yet a member of the Coalition on Homelessness, we warmly welcome you to join us, um, not only in our annual membership meeting, but all year round for all kinds of really important and uh, power building activities where we get to live out the mission, vision, and values that Nancy read, thank you, Nancy, and, um, and where we get to work together through the tough times and to accomplish um, some of the victories, but as we know, there's always more work to be done. Um, this is a special meeting for us. We are a membership coalition. There are some legal things that that means under Washington state law. And one of those legal things is that we're required to have an annual membership meeting. Thanks for joining us at it today. But one of the things that is powerful about this coalition is that we actually meet every month. And uh, Jody and Tim shared with me some of the numbers for the first four months of 2023. And I thought I would just um, start by reflecting on the fact that between these monthly general membership meetings, the public benefits are key trainings, the twice a month senior leader meetings, twice a month essential work, essential worker meetings, the brand new shop talk that Jody and Tim have launched and probably a bunch of things that I am forgetting. I think we've probably convened between 800 and 1,000 folks 
um, not unduplicated just in the first four months of this year. And honestly, that's why we're all here, right? It's why you come to the meetings. Nobody requires you to be here. It's why we feel lucky to work at this organization. Uh, we're a coalition of the willing is what we sometimes say. And what we and you are engaged in doing is sharing information, taking action, and building the collective power to advance the mission, vision, and values that we open our meetings with. That doesn't mean we get everything right. <laughs> In fact, it means that we sometimes need to have really hard conversations. And I think one of the things that I wanted to just acknowledge as we start our meeting is that this week has um, already been a pretty heavy duty week because as I think everyone knows, uh, Mark Jones, who has served as the initial director of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, our new regional homelessness authority, announced their resignation. So while this was not on the agenda for our annual meeting and we have a packed agenda, it really felt important to acknowledge that, to recognize the ways in which the creation of a new regional homelessness authority reflects what many of us have known and but have struggled to um, make real without this formal structure, which is there is no way that Seattle alone or Kent alone or a particular neighborhood in one of the 39 jurisdictions in King County is going to successfully make progress to house people experiencing homelessness. It absolutely requires a collective effort. One of the things that Mark was tasked with doing on behalf of our community is to build some of that sense of collective effort. Now, there are some reasons why that was not going to be an easy job for anyone. <laughs> um, in fact, I, um, I think that there are reasons why it will never fully be realized, but that work is essential it is necessary, as is the work to garner the additional resources that we need just to maintain what we're doing and build on it, since we do not intend to ever accept that 10 or 12 or 15,000 people experience unsheltered homelessness every day and night in this region. And we know there's a lot more needed to house folks. So among the things that Mark brought forward in their public statements consistently is the fact that we are charged to do better as a region. And we really appreciate and thank Mark for having been very explicit and direct in addressing the need to act adequately resource the homeless crisis response system, the need to connect homelessness crisis response to housing and the need to deliberately and explicitly address the extraordinary racial dis disproportionality, not only in who becomes homeless, but who experiences unsheltered homelessness and who does or doesn't get access to the two limited resources that we have. We also were very clear as a coalition um, about, and, and in, in public and in private, about our serious concerns about some of the basics not being in place. This isn't the time or place for us to rehash. I think many of you are fully aware of concerns about contract delays, of concerns about processes that didn't fully include the collective experience and wisdom of this sector. But what I think is really important at this point is to first of all acknowledge the folks who do the work every day and every night, whether they are employed by the King County Regional Homelessness Authority or by, by the agencies that are members of the Coalition on Homelessness, um, or whether they're part of our mutual aid network in this community and others, that work continues no matter who holds elected office, no matter who holds the position at the top of our Regional Homelessness Authority. And I think what we need to do as usual is to support the folks who are doing the work, make sure that this transition is an opportunity to create some additional stability as opposed to additional churn in our network that has already experienced far too much disruption. Um, 
I think that you all know um, Mark's made their announcement um, effective in the next 30 days. Helen Howell has stepped up as the interim director of the Regional Homelessness Authority. And um, there's lots of conversation yet to come, but what we would really like to invite you all to do is to get in touch with us if you have questions or if you have information that you wanna um, process, but really let's, let us think about how we do what we need to do when something unexpected happens which is not jump to conclusions, <laughs> not um, get on the blame train, and actually just calmly and accurately assess um, what the current lay of the land is and how we're going to keep making sure that we make progress. Because sometimes the politics of our region suck, and always that distracts from the work we need to do. There is no way that we are going to make progress without billions of additional new dollars being brought to bear in this system, without paying people who do this work um, fair wages and honorable wages, and without recognizing that it's unacceptable to have tens of thousands of people without the basics to survive, let alone thrive. So those have been our North Stars, they will continue to be. And we know that folks here um, understand that Everything is complicated, more complicated than what you read in the papers. And sometimes, um, well, I will just leave it at that. So uh, we really want to um, recognize and acknowledge the, the work that folks at the KCRHA are doing and the fact that they are going through quite a lot of change as have all of you. And I think that's probably, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, not to gloss over it, but to just recognize this is fresh information and that we um, have an agenda to turn to. And um, with that, I'm going to take up um, another piece of news that is of a very different vein, which is we are very excited here at the coalition to announce that we are hiring for two positions. I think that Jody is going to put the links to those positions, which are posted on our website and on LinkedIn and in a variety of places in the chat. Uh, I'll talk briefly about them. We warmly, warmly invite you to help spread the word about these positions and to get us a really skilled, deep, passionate pool of people um, from whom to select new coalition staff to work for and with all of you. One position is a brand new position for us at the coalition. And we're very uh, delighted to be able to hire an additional new position, which is communications and development. And that, that lead position is an hourly position. And it's someone who is going to help us do things like capture all of the work <laughs> that we are doing that we don't often have time to share publicly. And, um, and also ensure that we have the resources that we need to be able to continue to do this work in, in support of our mission and the work that you are all doing. Um, the second position is in some ways also a new position. It is a community policy manager position. And that is also a critical part of the work that we do. I think you all know that our policy advocacy work is everything from grassroots to city, county, state, and even federal work. We are in a position where um, because we are not publicly funded, we get to do things like, you know, get involved in lawsuits when necessary. Um, we also can propose legislation and we have. We can also weigh in on legislation that has been proposed by others, but we also really want to build our collective capacity to inform and guide public policies and budgets. And you've been a part of the coalition long enough probably to know that that is a big piece of what our uh, policy folks have done. So those two positions are open. Priority applications, uh, priority consideration is for completed applications that we receive by midnight on Monday, May 29th. And we really hope that you will help us spread the word uh, through your networks because that's one of the critical ways that we get um, that we get people we wouldn't otherwise necessarily know. <laughs> now, 
among the reasons that we're posting the, the community policy manager position is that we are bidding a very fond farewell to a member of our team. And I think that um, this is somebody who many of you know and have worked with in a variety of capacities because she's been a powerhouse um, behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the scenes, which is generally not her preference in a, in a number of organizations. And that is Sarah Robbins, our senior policy manager. So we have told Sarah that she does not get to opt out of being thanked because it's a value of this organization that we publicly recognize and appreciate the people who contribute to our collective work. But we also know that she really does not want to be front and center for long. So just going to ask Rachel to bring us um, a little musical interlude and allow you all to put some things in the chat that you might want Sarah to hear. This was Sarah's response when we told her that we needed to thank her on our annual membership meeting Zoom. Um, we are really pleased that we get to have Sarah through the end of June so that it's not, you know, imminent. And also, um, this is over war and not a complete Sarah goodbye. Um, I don't know, Sarah, if you would like to say anything right now. You are, of course, welcome to do what we're thinking of having a formal opportunity for us, whether online or in public. Uh, I, I will just say um, so when, yes, the, the, the song that was just played when I was told that I would be publicly thanked at the meeting. That's what I sang. I sang no, no, no. Uh, so that's funny that it's playing. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit um, later in the agenda about um, a little bit of what membership means to me personally um, for the coalition. So I think I'll just I'll kind of save my words. But thank you all for your um, very uh, kind words in the chat. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I, of course, have become a little bit emotional because it is really true that this work is only possible. We are a small and mighty team. We say it all the time, but it's really only possible when we have people who are not only really good at what they do, but really get the coalition. And in a lot of ways, um, Sarah has been one of the people who has helped to not only shape the coalition, but help me. Uh, have a deeper understanding of what this coalition is and what it means to be in coalition. So we are very, very happy to have uh, had the opportunity to have her be part of this team. And I think I may have lost track on my agenda, Jody. so please forgive me and help me out here. Um, I think that's the end of my piece of our agenda. Okay. That's correct. We're going to kick it over to Tim for a little bit more uh, coalition announcements and um, also ways members can get involved in the importance of the collective work we do together. Are you noticing a theme, folks? Absolutely. The theme for the morning is collective action. Um, whew, I will just say that is a tough act to follow. Um, I haven't worked with Sarah Long, but I really enjoyed it. And I'm hoping in the spirit of gratitude and collective action, we can talk about um, an important project the coalition has uh, taken on for a number of years, whether um, funded or not, and that is voting rights and registration engagement. Uh, we, every election cycle and sometimes outside of cycles, will do a lot of work engaging with folks experiencing homelessness and other hardships in service settings. Um, and we do that for a number of reasons. We do that because it is um, 
You know, we're working with folks who are historically unaware of their rights or marginalized due to misinformation. People are not routinely told that they are eligible to vote if they don't have an un if they don't have a residential address. Uh, people may not be aware of the 2022 legislation that allowed people with felony convictions to vote, even on probation. So we want people to know about their um, about their constitutional rights and their right to be civically involved. We also know that the more people who vote with lived experience and compassion to those experiencing homelessness and other crises um, builds a greater voting block um, to fund important local, uh, local services. Um, one opportunity of which is coming up on August 1st, we are voting on the Veterans, Seniors and Human Services Levy, which if you've been to meetings before, you've definitely heard us talk about and actively endorse. This is an important levy that would fund many contracts um, serving veterans, low-income seniors, uh, seniors of, of every income bracket, uh, people who have survived domestic violence situations, youth experiencing homeless and, homelessness and housing insecurity, uh, most of our vulnerable communities in King County. So in order to pass this levy, we are getting out into the community, like I said, working to let people know about their voting rights. And we are looking for folks to pass that on because we're a small crew. Um, in order to pass that information on, we are holding a volunteer and staff training on June 7th in person at the Douglas Truth Library. Uh, we are going to talk about what a person's eligibility would be to vote, how a person registers to vote in different ways, depending on what documentation they have. Um, how to cast their ballot, important dates, and also just the significance behind voting and what they would be voting for. Basically just having personalized conversations in a trauma-informed way um, to vulnerable members of our community. Um, like I said, it's open to volunteers who want to work on our behalf or staff who want to carry this information to their service sites or to their staff, um, to further staff. Um, and it looks like that registration link was popped in the chat. Thank you very much, Jody. Um, if anybody has any questions, please email me. You can reach me at tim at homelessinfo.org. Uh, even if you're just looking for some resources on how to share accurate nonpartisan information about how a person can exercise their voice and to pass this levy. And I appreciate everyone's support and I look forward to hearing from everybody. With that, I would like to pass it forward to talk a little bit more about membership to Jody. I see Allison raising her hand before oh, we yes. jump into the magic oh. of membership. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, the magic of membership is a good uh, next thing, but I just realized that because things move so fast, we have not, uh, while we're here talking about, um, thank you, Tim, the August 1st election date, the earliest possible date for an August primary election for renewing the Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services Levy, I don't think we have all come together as a coalition since we sadly lost by one vote at the King County Council to increase the rate for renewing the Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services levy. And um, this is one of the reasons we need a good communications person <laughs> to join our team because things move so fast. But I am very, very um, committed to making sure that you all know, like we, we generated collectively over 5,000 emails to the King County Council and the Regional Policy Committee on in service of attempting to raise the, the levy rate by a few cents. I won't take the time now um, to debrief that fully, but we will note um, that in a future email to give you all some of that context. But we always knew that renewing the levy at the flat 10 cent rate would not be adequate to maintain current service levels, which is why we worked as hard as we did. And you all helped do an incredible job um, and yet, 
that is the 10 cent renewal rate that will be on the ballot for the voters. And the only thing worse than having a 10 cent renewal rate is not renewing the levy at all. So we are good advocates and we know that you fight and you fight and every time you fight to increase the resources, but we are not gonna lose this resource. So we will be honest and clear about what is possible. And also um, we will get to work. In particular, I'm going to say on council member, Sarah Perry, who is a new member of the King County Council representing East Side communities. And on council member, Dave Up the Grove, who is a longtime member of the King County Council who is um, not running to be reelected to his position, but is running for another position. Both of them voted no on the increase and we only needed one of them to vote yes. So we have a lot of education to do. Um, we will go into what that might look like a little bit at a different time, um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, however, we can still be proud of the collective action and advocacy that we were able to mobilize. And truly that when we say small and mighty, it's not just like a cute thing to say. The reason we're able to mobilize, to turn people out, to make incredible, powerful public comments at multiple meetings on very short notice, to get fantastic messages that you all wrote and sent to your elected officials, to get media attention to something that is frankly a pretty dry issue if you don't know why the levy rate matters, is because we're organizers and our coalition organizes pretty much all the time right now you are part of being organized <laughs> and you're really good at it. And it's really what gives us all a sense of possibility and hope and collective power. So the membership piece that Jody's about to share with you is really of, um, of a whole with that. So I just realized though that we needed to update people about that, um, that setback. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, it was actually a really perfect sort of segue. Rachel is going to pull up uh, an infographic that I'm not going to read. We will put it up on the blog. Um, and I'm. this is a short section, and I'm really going to leave the majority of the time for Sarah to talk about what membership has meant to her and the different ways that she has been engaged. Um, and in context of that, to set her up, I mean, I you truly are the heart of our work, whether that's at the organizational level, at the individual level, we come together as Allison just very eloquently shared around a very particular uh, advocacy uh, issue, the levy. Um, you're the heart of what we do. And, and that engagement, the engagement that you do with us, the engagement that we do with you, that, that iterative sort of bi-directional building of information is, is the foundation of what we do, and it's what makes the Coalition on Homelessness a powerful, powerful voice, uh, because we have a strong member base, and we cultivate that, and we care for it. Um, it shows up in the advocacy we do, it shows up in the services, it shows up in how we literally gather together, whether it's virtually or in person. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Sarah, but I'm going to leave this. Tim and I have been working on what we're calling our member connects. And we're coming out of, you know, a very intense period for a lot of reasons, but primarily the pandemic. Lots of new colleagues are joining us. You all are taking on new roles because there's a lot of vacancy. And we want to hear how you're doing. And we want to hear about the work and we want to make sure that your new colleagues know what the coalition is and why we want to engage with you all. Um, so we're meeting with individuals, we're meeting with teams, we're meeting with, you know, leadership. So if you or your team or your colleagues want to meet with Tim and I and talk about what the coalition means to you, tell us about your work and maybe hear a little bit about how we want to support you and what we have to offer, please email Tim or I. We would love to chat with you. And on that note, I'm going to hand it to Sarah to talk about just how she has uh, loved the coalition and how we have loved her back. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Jody. Um, 
So I have a very long history um, with the coalition um, as a member of this organization for, I don't really know how many years, but let's just say a lot. Um, you know, I was first introduced to the coalition um, many years ago when I was the case manager doing uh, direct services with uh, families experiencing homelessness. Um, and I started attending coalition meetings uh, in person at the East Cherry Y. Um, and this was, I found it, the meetings to just be an amazing resource, both in terms of, um, you know, hearing about different resources, different advocacy, learning more about the system. Um, and that kept me coming. And the other thing that kept me coming to those meetings, which we don't quite have now, but maybe one day we'll be able to get back to is the that in-person connection with people doing the same or similar work. Um, being able to talk to other case managers and direct service providers, um, and share resources and problem solve around, you know, different kinds of, um, you know, how do you do a certain type of referral? Where do you refer people for, um, you know, all different types of resources? And that was really invaluable. And then knowing those people and having people that I can call on um, outside of, you know, just my direct coworkers um, to help with those kinds of things. Um, I then, you know, so those, those monthly, these monthly meetings, I, I always found to be invaluable. Um, my next career, uh, led me in a little bit of a different direction. I was an attorney and I, uh, was doing civil legal aid, um, around public benefits. Um, and I was tapped by the coalition to start doing our public benefits 101 trainings. And um, I remember one of the first, uh, Allison had been asking me for some time, you know, people are really hungry for information about public benefits, how to get their clients on public benefits, how to keep public benefits. Um, so I put together a uh, public benefits 101. I think we scheduled it for something like three hours, um, a three hour in-person training. And we, we, we scheduled it to do it twice. I, and over a hundred people showed up in person for that training, uh, which was pretty amazing. Um, and it was so interactive and um, such, you know, just realized how much people um, wanted to know about our um, public benefits and how to navigate DSHS. And, um, you know, I really tried to make it um, accessible and what I called like tips and tricks um, for uh, helping people get on and, and keep benefits. Um, I also um, became a member of the coalition board. I served on the board um, for two years, or I mean for two uh, terms. Um, and this was at a time when I joined the board when the coalition was not a 501c3 nonprofit. We were fiscally sponsor sponsored, um, but knew that to do all of the work that the coalition is capable of doing, we needed to become a 501c3. Um, and so, uh, you know, leading the leading the coalition both in governance and also through that process of becoming a 501c3. Uh, was, uh, I definitely learned a lot and I think it put the coalition, um, you know, in a good space um, to move forward. 
Um, I've been the policy manager here now as staff um, for about two years. Um, and I, I love policy work. I love working with all of you to understand what the barriers on the ground are for both direct service providers and those experiencing homelessness um, and be able to translate that into, um, into changes in our system and good policy um, that actually works um, for people. Um, I love engaging all of you in collective action uh, to use your voice to make change. And we've made a lot of change. Um, I mean, yes, this most recent example of the Veterans Seniors and Human Services Levy um, didn't, uh, you know, didn't go our way, um, but I'm confident that the levy will be renewed in August. And we've made so many other um, good changes um, including, you know, inflation adjustments at the county, uh, on con, you know, human service contracts at the city, um, things that we'll hear about today from our legislators around um, housing investments and DSHS investments. Um, and, you know, I think all of this is I have, you know, in my personal capacity, have been a member of the coalition in many ways. And I hope that that to some degree, you know, inspires all of you um, to think about ways to be involved um, as a member of this organization. And even though I'm leaving my position here and my work, my, my paid work here, uh, I definitely am not leaving the coalition. I'm not leaving my, my membership in uh, the coalition. I'm, uh, I'm going to be participating, finding my next the next way to um, continue my work um, here at the coalition. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being willing to let us pin you. Um, <laughs> um, and we are, um, you know, when I first came to the coalition as the first paid staff person in, in an organization that had been run by volunteers for 27 years, um, I was told that one of the things, one of the things that was necessary if you held a committee position, committee chair position or other leadership role within the coalition was that you couldn't leave until you had found your replacement. So um, one more time, I think we've had some people join. So Jody or Tim, if you'd be so kind as to put the position um, application links in, in the um, in the chat, Sarah is going to help participate in our hiring process for our community policy manager, uh, a, a, a new name for a position that is going to do some of the same and some new things. And we hope that you will all again, help us um, build a really great candidate pool for that position and for our communications and development lead position. And those of you who don't know Sarah personally might not know that she is an amazing baker and a connoisseur of all things baked goods. Not only that, but one of her kiddos um, requires gluten-free baking. So some celebratory consumption of baked goods will be in our collective future. We'll share more details when we have them. Um, We're gonna move now to our board elections. And this is similarly a time to feel your hearts um, swell with pride and possibility. We have a wonderful slate of candidates that the coalition's board of directors has put forward to you, the membership, for consideration. To clarify, it is our organizational members that are current on their dues payment who have the ability to cast a single vote for the slate of candidates during our elections. Our elections are a week long. They started this Monday, they go to the coming Monday. If you're not sure if your organization is eligible to vote, boy, would Jody be glad to talk with you <laughs> um, and send you the link to be able to vote. If you know that you've paid dues, but you haven't seen the link, please also contact Jody. Um, we will make sure that you get that link, which has been emailed to our primary contacts. So we are um, really happy to have two of our new 
board candidates available to join us in person this morning. We are going to actually start with them, with Megan Stanley and with Sherry Wu, and then um, we will have opportunities for the other uh, renewing and new board members who are not able to be here today to join us in June. So Megan, welcome. Um, we are so, so happy to have received your application. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting a chance to meet you briefly because of a shared person in our respective lives. And um, I am really looking forward to getting to know you and to work with you as a board member. And maybe since we have Megan here in person, if you would like to read her bio, you can find it on our website. But Rachel, I might suggest that we just let um, Megan unmute herself and speak briefly to the people. And maybe, I don't know how possible that is, but maybe. I'm happy to do that if you can hear me. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Well, Great. Hi, everybody. Um, you're looking at my pictures. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so, so good to be here and really, really excited to, you know, be able to work with you all. Um, as you can read on here, I work for King County. I am the Veterans Administrator, so I work within the Department of Community and Human Services. Um, I oversee our King County Veterans Program, which is a direct services program with two um, sites. And then I also oversee all of our um, community investments around veterans. And interestingly enough, uh, almost all of that work is captured under the Veterans Seniors and Human Services Levy, which Allison, thank you for talking about. Um, I will just very quickly say that while I can't really, you know, respond and say more, I am actually very open and able to receive any feedback about what people may want to see in that levy. Um, we especially want to hear from community partners. So please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, and as you can read on here, I have served on several boards. I came um, most recently from the city of Pittsburgh and deep, deep, deep interest in housing and human rights and have worked in housing and homelessness for the past 11 years. I think that's it. And I have a really cute little kid. Oh, wonderful. Megan, we're, we're really honored um, that you are bringing your experience and talents to this organization. Um, it's just going to be a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for the board, as well as for the staff and the members. And um, really look forward to having you join us at membership meetings when possible, but to think about ways that you, because you work in this sector, um, can be um, can be invited to put on and take off your multiple hats in the most flattering possible and productive possible way. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for making time to join us this morning. And I'm happy to introduce you and everybody else to our next wonderful board candidate, Sherry Wu. Um, Sherry is also here today. And so we get to see her lovely face here and read her wonderful biography and background. Um, again, this is at homelessinfo.org. You can see all of the wonderful people who've um, applied to serve this, this three-year term. And Sherry, I wonder if we could invite you to unmute yourself and say a quick hello. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. It is such an honor to be here. Um, I came in just in time to hear um, some of your boots on the ground stories, both supporting communities and also advocating for policy changes. And, um, you know, this is really the kind of energy and passion that is from the heart, that is deeply rooted in our values, that really gets me excited and ready to go in the morning, too. And any sort of nerves that I had about introducing myself um, just kind of melted away in the last 10 minutes. So I really thank you all for um, creating this space and for welcoming Megan and I. And um, yeah, I'm just absolutely humbled and honored to be here and to support you all to, and to learn and organize alongside all of you. Um, you know, never have I thought at this stage in my career, you know, graduating with my master's in public health, um, that I would serve on a board. Um, but the more that I learned about the organization, the coalition, um, some of your organizations, and after speaking to the board, um, I, I was just really drawn um, to, to th this energy that, that was just so infectious. And so um, here I am. I'm not going to go too deep, uh, uh, deep into what I've done in the past. Um, it's all on the website. 
But um, yeah, just want to show my face and say hello. And um, yeah, just very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Well, we are really um, mutually enthused. <laughs> and one of the things that is so wonderful about this opportunity is um, that we get to um, invite people who might not have thought of them themselves as uh, serving on a board, either at this stage in their lives or careers or ever. Um, but that is part of the beauty of the nature of this organization. So thank you so much, Sherry. We similarly really are eager to get a chance to know you better and to work with you and warmly welcome you to membership meetings in addition to, of course, your board activities. I'm going to move us fairly quickly through the rest of the slate of candidates because we don't yet have the pleasure of their um, personal attendance, but I want you all to get a chance to see. We have a wonderful two current board members who are renewing their terms of service, Derek Belgard, known to many of you as the executive director of the Chief Seattle Club and as a very profoundly committed advocate for people experiencing homelessness whose um, experience of homelessness includes the extraordinarily um, poignant and profoundly inequitable uh, experience of having been displaced as native peoples in, in, and experiencing multiple forms of loss of home place. Uh, Derek has also a long history with the Coalition on Homelessness. Uh, he and I first got a chance to meet when he was doing, a, I think, a, a, a school internship and served on a one night count team. Um, he has also worked at a number of different organizations in our community. Um, he is a really powerful leader and he is going to, I hope, uh, get a chance to join us at a future meeting, but I think um, many of you know Derek from, from his work and his long presence and leadership in our community. Um, the next person who I, I, I'm just gonna wait for Rachel to put the person up. I, there we go. The next person is our other renewing board member, the lovely and extremely dedicated Jen Romo. What a great picture of Jen. Um, Jen is a, um, currently somebody who serves as our board secretary. She has been an incredible force for pulling the board together and kind of creating a strong board of directors within the coalition. She has a long history of doing a variety of kinds of work in this community, supporting um, students who are um, in the involved in the child welfare system, supporting uh, people in the community through mutual aid work um, and through work at Real Change for many years. And she's currently working at the Seattle Parks and Recs Department where among other things, she helped to staff COVID era shelters um, that were host, housed in um, Seattle Parks and Rec buildings. Um, so thank you to Derek and, and Jen for renewing. Um, also, the next new member of the, of the slate is Robin Kosky, who was very sorry that she wasn't able to join today, but she'll be here in June. Um, Robin may also be familiar to some of you. Uh, she is currently um, employed in, in, in doing work or at, through the Puget Sound Regional Council. She has a long history in housing and in, uh, and in addressing homelessness, as you can read in her bio. She's also a longtime friend and ally of the coalition who really understands that while we need excellent people in government, we need good bureaucrats, we need people who can push policy from the inside, we also sure as hell need them from the outside. And Robin um, has been very enthusiastic in um, her desire to join and participate in the coalition as a board member. Um, and then the final person on our slate of candidates who also sends his heartfelt regrets and will join us in June, but is currently at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Coalition annual meeting um, is Harold Odom. Harold, again, may be familiar to many of you, also has a very long history of work in this community in a variety of settings. He is currently a member of the Lived Experience Coalition. He is working um, with the King County Regional Homelessness Authority in the Partnership for Zero work as a housing stability provider. 
Harold has personal experience of homelessness and marginalization and has demonstrated extraordinary compassion, wisdom, and leadership in a variety of ways in our community, including in the creation of a regional homelessness authority. And we're really excited to have Harold join the board of directors as well. So that's a pretty good slate, I think you'll agree. And we're uh, very, very pleased to have the opportunity for, um, for bringing new people on on an annual basis. So if you um, looked at this wonderful group and thought I might want to do that, or I might know someone who might want to do that in the future, now's the time. Just because we're having elections now doesn't mean we're not thinking about the future. Um, we actually put board elections on hold during COVID for two cycles which was um, you know, a necessary decision at the time, but it means we've got some catching up to do. So please feel free to reach out to me or a member of the board if you would like to talk about that possibility. And with that, I think um, we're just gonna remind folks the voting process has been from Monday, May 15th through Monday, May 22nd. If you are not sure about whether or not you can vote, please put it in the chat, contact Jody or um, any other coalition staff person. We also want to thank one of our board members who is leaving after long service, um, and that's Ben Mitch, but Ben is not able to be here this morning because of a work commitment, so we're gonna thank Ben in June. So come back in June. And with that, we are turning to some pretty remarkable folks who also bring long histories of service in this community and long histories of connection to the Coalition on Homelessness, who are themselves powerful advocates and allies and who have an awful lot to share with us. So I'm turning things over to Sarah and our wonderful elected guests. Thanks to, um, thanks to them for joining us this morning. Yes, thank you. Um, we are um, very fortunate this morning to be joined by um, three of our Washington State elected officials. Um, one, um, so we we have uh, Representative, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Emily Alvarado. Um, we will be joined um, at ten thirty um, by Representative uh, Nicole Macri. And we will also be joined by Senator Rebecca Saldana, who is is Senator Saldana on yet? She might she might be joining us. Um, she is here. she is joining us in a few minutes, just after ten. Yeah. Yes, great. Um, so before we um, jump into our discussion about um, the legislative session debrief, what's to maybe come next session? Um, we, we at the coalition um, wanted to um, thank and give recognition to um, some very important partners um, at DSHS. Um, we are um, thanking, and maybe after I do a thank you, maybe Representative Alvarado can also say a few words. Um, so, as everyone knows, uh, we are gonna be talking today about wins in the legislature. Um, and one of those wins in the legislature was um, House Bill 1260 that will, um, that will be eliminating um, the repayment of aged, blind, or disabled benefits when uh, folks are approved for social security benefits. Um, and today we want to thank um, the folks at DSHS that really um, made this happen. I think uh, we are joined by um, by Eric Eric Peterson from um, the Office of Programs, Susie Young from the uh, legislative staff at DSHS, um, Babs Roberts, who's the um, head of the Community Service Division, um, was not able to join us due to a conflict with the um, poverty reduction work group meeting this morning. But I want to say, you know, the way that state budgets and state uh, legislative changes work, 
is the very first thing that happens is that the department puts together what's called request legislation. So these are things that the department proposes to change. And some of these things are very boring. And some of you know these are things like, we need more staff to do certain types of work. We need a new uh, computer system. We need, um, and some of those things are policy changes. And this session, DSHS put forth a decision package that really centered, in, in, in my opinion, really centered um, the goal of um, moving people out of poverty. Um, and one of those things was the elimination of the repayment of aged, blind, or disabled benefits um, when people get that back payment from Social Security. Um, and just, and when when something is put forth by the department as opposed to something that's put forth by advocates um it it has the and has that strong support of that department um it is a combined effort to move it forward and Everything that I have experienced both this session and have heard from lawmakers and have heard, um, this is something that DSHS uh, really put a lot of effort into. And we are very grateful to um, the two of you, Susie and Eric um, and Babs, um, for your work on this and uh, wanted to recognize, um, you know, we are in a position where we always want to thank people um, for good work and for partnership and, um, and that's where we are this morning. So thank you both very much and thank you both for being here. Um, and I'm also gonna let, uh, so Representative Alvarado was the legislative sponsor of this um, of this bill, um, and so I'm going to let her also talk about um, her work with DSHS on this. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be here. Um, I'm have to change one second. Let me change the view so I don't just stare at myself. Uh, now that you've pinned me. Um, it, it's great to be here, and I really want to uh, acknowledge DSHS. Um, it, as Sarah said, it really makes such a difference when a department can acknowledge that in their own program there are inequities, and that we can do better in the work that we do, which we know makes a difference. We know ABD is such a critical lifeline for people. We know that that's what's helping to keep um, people, give them some ability to meet some basic needs, but to reflect on it and have the courage to say, but it still could be better, it has flaws, um, is a really big deal. And as a, um, as a bill sponsor, it's so helpful in my advocacy to be able to say the department has acknowledged that this is a priority. So really wanna thank um, DSHS for, for looking internal um, and hearing the voices of people who are impacted and who use this program and looking back at themselves and saying we can do better and then fixing the problem. And for uh, all of the folks in this meeting, this is not a cheap problem to fix. Um, this is the thing, uh, and, and quite frankly, everything that we all care about, uh, we know how to solve so many of the problems and they're just not cheap problems to fix. But this is not a cheap problem to fix. When we first started working with DSHS, there was an estimate for how much it would cost to eliminate the payback. Um, that number went up after more analysis was done. And really, we're looking at $50 million a biennium it's going to cost. Um, and one way to say it is that it's a cost to eliminate the 
payback requirement. The other way to frame it is that there are going to be $50 million in the hands of the poorest people in our state because we're changing this policy. Um, that is straight up giving cash benefits to people who we know need it most. Um, it's not the message I led with when I was talking in the legislature, but I'll say it here today, which is this is real money for real people who need it most of all. And um, I think, you know, it's unfortunate that this policy does not take place immediately. So for those of you who work front lines, we just need to be careful that part of the compromise of going through the legislative process and to help get it through, um, particularly some Senate committees, was to push out the implementation date. So unfortunately, we literally made a policy that said, we acknowledge that this is horrible, but people will need to suffer for another two years. Um, so people will be required to pay back their ABD until um, 2025, if I, right, 2025. Um, but starting in 2025, that money um, will now remain in the pockets of um, those who need it most. So thank you to DSHS. Um, I think one of the other things that we didn't mention is that part of the reason why it's so incredible when you have expensive legislation for a department to be behind it is because then it ends up in the governor's budget, um, which gives a, a really beneficial way to work on it from the legislative perspective. So thanks again to DSHS, incredible policy. Glad we were able to get it across the finish line together. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Alvarado. And I don't want to put either of you on the spot, but if either of you want to say anything, you are you are welcome to. Yeah, I just will kind of echo what I put in the chat here is it takes a village, right, to get any legislation passed. Um, so just much appreciation to everybody who showed up, supported the bill. You know, we had people come out and testify um, alongside us. So that is all, you know, everything that goes into getting this. Um, Past to help help our clients. We know, you know, a lot of us have worked um, in direct service, and we know that there's still a need beyond kind of what our programs can provide. So when we can push that needle, we're happy to do it. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I I won't piggyback. I just want to say thank you. Uh, this uh, particular um, effort means a lot to to us and to to my team in particular. Uh, it's been a long time coming and something we've been kicking around internally um, and working really hard to crunch numbers and to, um, you know, uh, get the this idea in front of the right people. And Babs has been working really hard to do the same. And so, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you. This one uh, feels really good. Great. Thank you, Susie and Eric. And you know, as a, I spent most of my career as a public benefits attorney, and I can say that Eric's team that works on um, ABD benefits um, are a great team to work with on uh, policy, uh, you know, for policy questions and clarifications and, and moving our, our programs, um, especially ABD in the right direction. So thank you. Um, great. Well, um, Representative Alvarado, um, thank you for um, joining us for, you know, legislative debrief. We talked about um, the big bill that you sponsored um, this year. Um, any, uh, if you want to talk to us about um, that particular bill or other um, bills or budget ask or, or wins um, from this session, I guess, that you are most proud of in your uh, first year in the legislature. Thank you. Um, again, nice to be with everyone. Good to be here with you. I wish we were in person. It would be better. Um, so this was my first session. Um, and what that means for me is that I had an opportunity to work on 
a range of bills, um, but it was still more of an entry point, a beginning year for me. So look forward to strategizing with all of you about what other big things are yet to come. Um, but some things I worked on, you know, um, uh, eliminating poverty is really a priority for me. And uh, it's a key reason that I ran for the legislature. And um, while there are certainly some champions in the House, and I know um, Rep. Macri is coming on, who uh, is a champion, uh, and there are some supporters in the Senate, like Senator Saldana, um, you know, they're, they're not issues that get a lot of attention. Uh, Anti-poverty discussions really, I, I feel, get buried, um, despite the incredible work of advocates. Um, and so in working on 1260 and seeing a really horrible policy that's embedded in one of our anti-poverty programs, um, I got hooked into a couple of other efforts to try to um, improve our anti-poverty and basic needs programs and find other places in which those um, regressive and harmful policies exist and try to eliminate them. Uh, one bill I worked on um, uh, was a bill that would eliminate a policy for youth in the foster care system who get their public benefits, their uh, federal benefits, if they receive them, they get garnished uh, by DCYF and get taken to pay for the, pay for the uh, cost of uh, foster care. Again, these are youth in our community who, if they had that resource set aside, could exit foster care with a nest egg, with money to pay for rent, to buy a car, um, uh, to, to care for themselves. And so we worked hard to eliminate that policy. The bill did not pass, uh, which tells you a lot about what we, the work we have to do, but we were able to establish a work group that hopefully will quickly review this policy and figure out a way to end it, um, making sure that again, the people who deserve public benefits in our state are actually getting them in, in the most fair and equitable way. Um, I also work to help put forward a budget proviso. Um, I don't know how many of you know some great work by Poverty Action Network um, in which there's a, um, a Office of Fraud and Accountability that spends a lot of FTE and a lot of resources at the state to investigate public benefit fraud. Um, they're not a very, uh, the, the work costs more than it uncovers in fraud. Um, and I believe that we can better use public servants to help reduce harm instead of create harm. Uh, that proviso did not go forward, but look forward to continuing the effort to make sure that especially in a time when we have incredible workforce constraints that we're putting our workforce to work helping people. Um, so that's something you could see me continuing to work on. What we were able to secure in the budget was a $8 million investment in community-based organizations. Actually, some of you all might be participating in that to help people access, better access TANF and public benefits. So to be uh, community resources in navigating to public benefit programs. So that was uh, advocacy ask from community partners and happy that we were able to make that go forward. Um, so those were some specific pieces that I worked on. I see Senator Saldana here, so happy to make this more of a conversation. A few things I will say just to this group um, where we didn't make as much progress and we'll have to continue to keep talking is on tenant protections. Um, most of the bills that were intended to stabilize renters failed, um, and I think it's really incumbent upon us to continue to strategize, work together, and advocate to make sure that the million-plus renters in the state of Washington have some stability. Um, and also, while we made really record investments in affordable housing, $400 million in the Housing Trust Fund, which is big, it's great, it's also not sustainable. 
So we'll need to continue to look at how we create uh, dedicated revenue sources that can make sure that we can continue to build the housing and the solutions that we know uh, will end homelessness for people. Great, thank you so much, uh, Representative Alvarado. Um, we've been joined by uh, Senator Saldana, um, Senator from um, my district, the 37th district in South Seattle. Um, welcome, thank you for joining us today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, this session? What are some of the bills that you worked on um, that you are um, the most proud of that either made it through this session or uh, that we will continue to support you on uh, next session? Thank you, Sarah. Um, and of course, we're so, so lucky um, to have Representative Emily Alvarado um, in the legislature. Uh, you know, because really we can do one-time investments, but in terms of doing the kind of structural policy change that needs to happen uh, and really centering and recognizing renters as residents and, and voters and um, community that, that need to be included and centered in policy, you know, we need champions that um, can dig into the weeds. And um, I'm really, really grateful that um, Emily stepped up to run and um, to serve the people of Washington in this way. Um, and so the, on, the, on my side, um, a couple of things. My, my big big bill that um, got more work this, this session, but is um, needs revenue to be able to make it real is unemployment insurance for undocumented workers. Is you know, part of, we wouldn't be struggling so much if all work was actually respected and valued and um, compensated equitably. Uh, so I, I know one of my big priorities this year was really to be um, as flexible as possible, but to be really clear that what I needed is for us to value essential workers. And so many of you are part of that um, in terms of like, I wanted, my big ask was, in the budget was rate increases and for um, housing providers, for the people that actually keep our community safe, mental health providers. Um, and, and so I think that um, I don't have the detailed numbers, Emily might, in terms of what actually increases we were able to get, but that was something that was really clearly stated. It wasn't just my priority, it was uh, the priority of a lot of us in ways and means and within our caucus. And, I, and so that was one of our, like you know, North Stars this year is that we need to make sure that the essential workers aren't sacrificial workers. And so that was both my unemployment insurance for undocumented workers that are, you know, highly unemployed, underemployed still, or overemployed and undercompensated in our hospitality workforce, in our agricultural workforce, in our restaurants, um, and so in, in care. And so I think that was a big piece we had, we really hashed out that policy, but at the end of the day, we need um, to write our upside down tax code and be able to come up with a fair share of revenue um, to be able to build that out. But um, so that was my big work. The smaller ones, um, but also super significant is a pilot program that I've been working on um, around child welfare, um, housing vouchers um, has been a pilot program. We're able to make it permanent this year. And that was 5256. Uh, I think the other pieces were um, supporting good bills that came from the House. Um, one is to start to, you know, and I think probably you probably talked about it, but um, was just, um, I think it was um, 1447, but Peterson, so, to look at the um, um, poverty reduction task force priorities and looking at things that like back in seven years ago when I first came, you know, we were just so happy to try to like increase a tiny bit ABD and HEN. And now, you know, we're trying to actually like address some of the historic um, problems with these policies that um, criminalize, po you know, poverty and, and try to blame people. Um, and so of, of actually trying to make it easier for people to access it when they need it to be able to keep some of their income. Um, and so increasing the threshold, making, um, getting rid of the 60 month for child only cases. Uh, and so I think all of that was, you know, starting to move us in the right direction. Um, trying to think if there's anything in particular that hadn't already been spoken about. But, 
you know, those were those were some of the bills that I, you know, I prioritize that um, I feel really good about. I think the other one that I, there's a couple in a uh, similar in this space, including uh, Claire Wilson's, in terms of just making sure that when people are 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 coming back into society from, um, you know, doing their time, is making sure that we're not overly penalizing them. The the gate fee at forty dollars was set, I think, like twenty. 30 years ago and never been increased. And so um, we weren't able to get the full bill um, the way we wanted to, but started again to un unravel some of that really bad policy and, you know, um, put in the budget an increase. And then, you know, we'll start building momentum to make sure that we actually make that a permanent thing. Um, yeah, so th those are some I really open to questions because I do think that's the most helpful is what you're, you're interested in. And um, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to um, turn it over to Allison uh, for a minute to. Um, oh no! I'm sorry. I'll I'll wait until we've wrapped up. We're we're doing a little behind the scenes coordination, sorry. folks. Sorry, <laughs> it's real. Um, there's a there's a significant announcement about federal stuff that just came out, but I'll wait until after our um, wonderful state lawmakers. But since you gave me the mic, Sarah, I'm just going to say like. Representative Alvarado, Senator Saldana, Emily and Rebecca. Those of us who know you know that you have been not just fighting for good policies, but actually crafting good policies informed by the real experiences of real people on the ground for years in a variety of different roles. But there are a lot of folks here who might not know about your backgrounds and about the fact that, um, well, frankly, unlike many elected officials, um, you're very attuned <laughs> to um, some of the realities that some of the folks who provide direct services, who have experienced homelessness, racism, poverty, and other forms of discrimination discrimination, marginalization, and oppression um, are, are, this is not news to you. Doesn't mean that you don't uh, have much to learn and, and want to hear from people, but I think it's a great opportunity as we invite people to think about questions they might want to ask you or legislation around things like gun control that you also worked to pass <laughs> or the special session that was shorter than anticipated but maybe we could just invite you to briefly, um, you know, let folks know a little bit about what, what brought you to this work in your current positions. Because I think that's a very powerful thing for folks to know. Oh, you're muted, Rebecca. Oh, I was just saying, um, my daughter stayed home from school today because she's not feeling well. But um, because I think that was my first meet well my first meeting back from um having her 14 years ago was uh, to come to sketch and and i think as a student and as someone that grew up in delbridge in west seattle that emily now represents um my my family well um you know it was always you know kind of just seeing um how un how incredibly unjust and, and impossible in my mind that we have housing unhoused people in the city of Seattle. Um, that was like 50, 40 years ago, um, you know, and on. And in having, you know, family that live um, on the other side of the border of Mexico, um, you know, living in, you know, shacks with, you know, dirt floors growing up and shared facilities and um, corrugated roofs and then being able to come across the border and come up here and see like, you know, we have opportunities and yet in the, you know, this most wealthiest, fastest growing city that we continue to find it acceptable to have people unhoused and think that, you know, we're doing well. And so I think it just, that has always been part of, um, what drives me is, is to recognize that housing is healthcare and, um, that people that do work, um, whether it's taking care of kids or cleaning houses or working in the fields, I mean, it's because we have created a system of, of inequities and have um, built our country on uh, racism and, and uh, that, you know, we have got to start to understand that the infrastructure of care um, and providing of food is essential and needs to be 
um, respected um, by our economy and by our state government. So I think that this year, I'll just say, like, I feel like while we may have been unique, I do think that we are building a pipeline of folks that have lived experience, but you can have the greatest lived experience if you don't have organizations like Skitch, like if you don't have, um, you know, counter systems and counter organizations and, and democratic and civic institutions to be able to be in partnership to do the undoing while we're continuing to say like we're we're not trying to blow up our democracy um as um, frustrating as it is we're we're trying to work with what we've got and try to build it to it, move it into a better place that allows more people to feel housed and supported and and included in it and so i think that that is, you know, a ten attention that we all hold, and I think we, there's more of us in the legislature now. But the system and the structure and the budget process is not yet, you know, able to um, make those shifts and those changes where we are. But I think what one thing I'll just say is, in the Senate, I feel like we have changed the narrative of like when we were making big investments this year in behavioral health, on housing and in special education and education was that these are down payments. We know there's more work to do to get where we need to go. And so I think instead of like, wow, we're, we did so great um, and pat ourselves on the back, it, I think there's definitely like, I feel really proud of the budget that we put together this year. And I feel really solid about most of the policies that we weren't able to advance. But I think it is, you know, building that, that um, capacity to um, of what it will take to actually, you know, recognize that if we're doing a transportation package and there's a, a contractor that says this is how much it costs, we don't then pay 83% and think we're doing good, you know. And so I think that's other places sure. like on the infra on nonprofit care work and and you know we think that we can nickel and dime this side and it's like no, this is what's most essential for really thriving communities and thriving economy is to have childcare, <laughs> you know, so we should pay that at 110%, you know, and, you know, not at 83 and 85% this year, right? And so I think those are the kinds of conversations we're able to have because of um, organizations that continue to take time, because we know you guys are not getting paid, and then you're coming here to do this organizing work, which is really kind of like, you know, whether you're booking it or not on your timesheets, right? And so I think this part is really important. So I just, you know, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for giving me a little bit more space to, to share a little bit more about myself. And um, I mean, I'm lucky, Emily's lucky that we have been to represent places where people think beyond their 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 district and beyond what, you know, their their home value and and are able to think and dig into really incredible policy. And so, you know, I'm lucky to be a reflection of that in terms of the 37th, um, which, you know, it's South Seattle, International Chinatown, Central District, Skyway, um, for the folks that maybe don't know, but I think most of you live in my district, so I thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Molly, um, uh, I need to jump, so I'll just say a few things, a little bit about myself and my background and what I, how I show up. Um, wearing this new hat, which is that I, I was raised in a family uh, where the Paul Wellstone um, vision of we all do better when we all do better um, was really central growing up. Uh, and I've always thought that to be true. Um, and I can imagine a world in which we all do better. I think it's possible. Um, so that little bit of hopefulness and that little bit of um, vision of the collective and us all having our basic needs met, you know, has always driven me in my personal life and in my professional life. Um, how I started being connected to housing, though, is a, a good one for this group, which is I went to law school at UW and I did my first legal internship with what was then the Legal Action Center, Catholic Community Services, and now the Tenant Law Center, and uh, very poorly represented a few people who were facing eviction because in most cases, people couldn't pay the rent um, because the rent is high and people don't have enough income. And I saw that for one minute and 
I've never stopped working on housing ever since because I it was very clear that the system was broken and God bless the civil legal aid attorneys out there doing everything they can um, uh, given how broken the system is. But um, I've spent my life since then working on affordable housing and um, because of that work and because of work that I've done um, at the Office of Housing at the City of Seattle, working with community partners who are both on the front lines, working with folks experiencing homelessness, housing folks experiencing homelessness, um, I'm quite, de I'm deeply grateful to and quite deferential to um, those people who make it their lives and their work uh, to be supporting our neighbors uh, in need. So I'm grateful to all of you and I rely on your input and your vision to help drive my advocacy and my work now in the legislature. Um, that was essential with 1260. Um, the, the attorneys, the public benefit attorneys who showed up and testified impacted people who showed up and testified, who I know only showed up and testified because they also had support from uh, you all. Um, so thank you for all of that. It makes a huge difference. Um, I do need to run, but in the future, I'd love to talk to you about how we can um, uh, continue to work together and make meaningful progress in Olympia and here in Seattle and King County. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, wow, I, we are really lucky to have these two um, stellar um, advocates that really um, understand the, the basic needs um, that should come first in our policy um, making and our budget advocacy. Um, Deeply, deeply appreciate it. Um, one of the questions, oh, got it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Rebecca, you have to head out too. Oh, you're muted. I, I can stay probably for one question. Um, yeah. <laughs> got it. Um, so bo both of you mentioned um, TANF and we had a question come in, um, ahead of time about TANF. So maybe I will, and um, you know, there were, we got a lot um, accomplished this legislative session on improving our TANF program. Um, but the one thing that we didn't get was a, you know, a broad time limit extension on the 60 month time limit. Um, and for those that you don't, that don't know prior to 2011, our state had a um, very broad 60 month time limit extension for families that if you were essentially um, doing what you were supposed to do within the program and you needed more time on the program and it was a hardship to um, lose your benefits, you could continue to receive um, benefits, ensuring that families um, always have a, um, a safety net and a basic income and ensuring that our system uh, provides a safety net. Um, and I, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on how we go back to that. I, I know advocates have worked on this consistently every session since 2011. Um, and um, what you think it might take. Well, um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. One is like one of the loudest voices, you know, are businesses, including our own businesses of trying to find workers, right? And so I do think that um, that narrative comes up and it, and it impacts us um, on this policy, you know, because, and I think that there's that piece. I think the other piece is, you know, while um, as we are looking at COVID and pandemic relief revenues, um, you know, supports from the feds, you know, dissipating in our own, I think there was a real concern about, um, 
you know, rolling, you know, going everything back to before 2011, um, when, because I will say, like, I think this is one thing that may or may, may be different in the Senate, is that so many of my colleagues went through that big, horrible cutting recession time, um, and they're, you know, although, like, we want to, like, you know, we're, we're mad at them, you know, but at the same time, like, um, for many of them, it was excruciating and it continues to feel like, like they tried to do new revenues um, and they weren't able to, and that, you know, or got repealed. And, um, and so they just, you know, feel like, like they did try that, right. And they didn't have the revenue. And so then they were forced, they felt forced to make these horrible cuts. And so they, they have really embedded in their, in their brains, like, I'd rather do a little and know I can complete it than, you know, actually do something and then have to be faced with that reality again of having to take away from people. So I think part of it is why we need the revenues, whether it's the wealth tax, whether it's progressive rate, you know, and continuing to kind of like think about how do we build this need for, we need to actually grow our state budget to modernize. But there's also places where we can continue to improve upon, like what can we actually where are we spending money that we don't need to spend it there? And, you know, and that's really hard. Like once we have a state agency or once we have a certain amount of employees at one agency, even, you know, even if we're going to say, hey, we're going to move people from this agency over here, like, you know, it doesn't quite work out in real people's lives most of the time. So I think that's also our challenge. But so I think that'd be a big piece. Part of it is educating and making sure like it's not everyone like, you know, if we're doing the other systems right, you know, hopefully people are getting more money in their pockets. And then they, if they aren't actually, you know, so I think there's that combination of like, um, you know, we need more revenues if the forecasts are going to say that it's going to really increase how many people stay on. Um, and, or if we can kind of address some of the other issues so that more people will feel like they don't have to stay on because they now are in a place where they have an apprenticeship and they're getting paid to learn and it's working for them. So I think that's our big, I mean, I think it is in that space. And so, um, you know, you guys saw like my bad amendment that, you know, got, you know, really like skinny down Peterson's um, bill on, um, on the expansions. And so then, you know, through negotiations, we're able to get, what do we think our budget can handle? Um, and we can do it responsibly is, is how my budget writers are thinking about it. So I think the more that we can help them walk them through that this, you know, and I, and the other thing that we got them to think about is just like, what is the cruelest policy we have on the books and how do we repeal those? Right. And so like, is like, they recognize, you know, like getting them to feel like this is just wrong and just, and we need to figure out what do we do to build our budget um, to be able to undo that harm. So I think those are the kinds of conversations is like, this is just wrong, you know? And, <laughs> and so I think those places like, you know, that, and the, how do we get our budget to be able to do, to stop doing this wrong thing? Um, so I think that, that kind of like handholding a little bit and also, you know, of course, having people share their experiences, you know, and being able to kind of like encapsulate how this thing is really the thing that's making it really hard on people. And if they just, like, it doesn't mean they're going to be on for life, but maybe their children are going to be on for it. Like, I mean, so I think that's the place that I always say, I don't know if I, I've already gone too long. Thank you. <laughs> Mac, you'll take you. it from here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and welcome, Representative Macri. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we started with um, Representative Alvarado and Senator Saldana um, giving us a little bit of um, background on themselves and what led them to um, their roles in the legislature. And then um, talking about some of the issues um, that they are uh, most proud of from uh, this last session. So I will um, hand it over to you. Well, thank you. It's great to be here and an honor to be among all of you. Um, some of you may have heard my uh, story before about how I got into elected office, but um, I very clearly credit the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness for um, propelling me towards uh, political um, activism and and ultimately into elected office. Um, I um, 
first attended a coalition meeting as a staff member of DESC <clears throat> uh, many years ago and was um, quickly recruited uh, by a couple of leaders in the coalition to go testify at a Seattle City Council meeting around um, homelessness services. And that was just the start of a journey um, into getting more involved in, in homelessness and housing advocacy uh, locally and across the state. Um, and um, I've been in um, the state legislature since 2017. Um, so this is my seventh year serving in the legislature. Um, and I um, serve on a couple of committees. I serve on the appropriations committee. I'm vice chair of house appropriations, which this is the state operating budget committee. And I also serve on the healthcare and wellness committee. Um, and uh, what I'm most proud of. So I'll say for this past session, um, I am really most proud of the investments uh, that we have made um, both in um, the workforce um, who is uh, who are supporting people <clears throat> um, just generally, certainly in the homelessness and housing sector, um, but across a number of different helping professions that definitely intersect with um, with our homelessness crisis. So in, in behavioral health, um, we made some significant rate increases um, that will, I think, bolster the supports for people and, and most directly um, help support the workers in that sector. Um, we have saw um, for the first time ever inflationary increases to homelessness funding, um, expansion of funding, the securing of ongoing funds for previously one-time investments, um, and all of that will, I think, provide more security to our most vulnerable community members across the state. Um, we've also made increases in child care, um, in K-12, in long-term care. So our home care workers, our um, adult family home workers. So I know many of you um, uh, that your work in the homelessness response sector also intersects um, it, with all these other areas of work. Um, so I'm most proud of that. Uh, it, it sounded like Senator Saldana also talked on talked a little bit about our anti-poverty investments. Um, House Democrats fought real hard for that. So improvements in TANF, um, expansion of housing and essential needs, program or continuation of funding and housing and essential needs that otherwise gonna, was going to be cut, um, cash benefit increases um, in TANF and ABD. Um, increases in our um, food security programs um, wh while the, you know, to try to um, uh, at least stem some of the pain from um, fairly dramatic federal cuts um, in food security. So, um, you know, those are the things that I am most proud of. I think many of you know, I, on the policy side, I work um, quite a lot on, you um, on um, uh, renter protection policies. It was not a good year for renter protection policies in Olympia, um, but I'm really proud of the work that we did there. We got a rent stabilization um, bill out of um, the policy committee and the fiscal committee in the house, which is first time ever. I've been working on rent control and rent stabilization policy um, since I came to the legislature. Um, first, I never got a hearing, then I got a hearing, but no movement. And now we're starting to see more and more um, legislators um, take hold. We had a, we had a supermajority of House Democrats sign on to rent stabilization policy. So while we're not getting as far as we want, um, we are making uh, bigger strides than we ever have before. And we have a bigger team of folks um, committed to it. Um, you know, we we uh, just got out of this special session. Um, it was, a, you know, kind of brutal for uh, those of us who who work on um, harm reduction and public health strategies and work closely um, with uh, people who use drugs and who um, personally or whose families and communities are impacted uh, by drug use. Um, and so, while, while I didn't agree with the policy that was passed and the criminalization of um, of particularly substance use disorder. Um, I was really proud of the work we were able to do to get some key protections in there. Um, 
into into that bill that um, passed yesterday. And I know there's a lot of questions about that. Um, and so I'm glad to have some follow up conversation with the coalition about how how the policy might impact the harm reduction work that many folks are doing in their in their current programs. So I'll leave it at that because I assume there might be questions and want to make sure my comments um, align with what people's specific interests are. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Rep. Macri. Um, we would love to, um, in a future meeting, talk about the impact and and just I'm not sure um, how much everyone knows about um, the special session, but. Uh, I'll give a little bit um, of context. Um, in 2021, there was a case in front of the uh, Washington Supreme Court um, that is referred to as Blake um, that ruled that Washington State's um, possession of drugs law was unconstitutional. Um, it being a felony, something that could be charged with a felony be, even if they were in possession of a controlled substance um, without potentially without their knowledge. So it was the task of the legislature to um, rewrite our um, drug, or drug possession laws, which in last session, there was a, um, a temporary um, fix. And in this past session that just ended, um, right at the end of session, the bill that was going forward um, ended up not passing through the legislature, um, which required the governor to um, call a special session, um, which started on Monday, um, maybe the shortest special session. Um, it started and ended in a day <laughs> um, and so now, sorry, my dog is protecting me from uh, a cat um and so um you can we can drop some links into the chat that talk about more of the details of what this new um legislation um looks like um we have a um a new uh, structure for possession of a controlled substance that is now a gross misdemeanor um, with a potential sentence that's less than what a gross misdemeanor would usually carry. Um, we have a new um, a, a new classification of um, a gross misdemeanor around um, public use of controlled substances, um, which is part of what Rep. Macri um, referred to as, you know, criminalizing substance abuse disorder. Um, and there's a few other um, components. So it would um, just want to make sure people have, and there's lots of good um, reading out there um, that, that talks about, you know, what the bill um, actually does. Um, so I, I guess I will ask you, Rep. Macri, um, in, the, in this interim time between the end of this session and, and the next session, um, what are your thoughts on um, work that we can be engaged in to help move particular legislation forward next session? What are you looking forward to? Um, for the next session. Yeah, so I think I'm always um, focused right after session on the implementation of um, what we passed. Um, and um, so on the budget stuff in particular, I wanna make sure our state agencies are getting resources out to community as quickly as possible and in a, and in a in a format and process that will have the most beneficial effect. So I've had some conversations with Department of Commerce of uh, around the um, homeless um, system funds that we put in there. Um, we put some clear language in the budget 
uh, to make sure that we are maintaining current service types and levels to the extent possible um, in community um, before we're um, funding new things. And so we're in this weird place where we had all this COVID federal money at the local and state levels that a lot of that money is sunsetting. A lot of your organizations may be going through that process of uncertainty. Um, and so we try to uh, craft the state budget to provide uh, some stability during this uncertain time. Um, and part of that maintaining services um, includes um, helping helping uh, workers and organizations uh, meet the inflationary cost increases in communities. And so that's how we structured it. Um, advocacy uh, from the coalition and its member organizations to make sure that commerce um, is doing that. They do seem very committed to doing that, but your voices in that implementation will be very helpful. Um, uh, we are going to be uh, looking at a number of and policy things, I'll say the other big policy area I worked on this year was around um, behavioral health services. So there's a number of policy bills to improve crisis response care um, in behavioral health through our 988 system. Um, I did a lot of work on just bolstering uh, behavioral health, our Medicaid-funded behavioral health system. Um, there has not been real focus on ensuring that there are adequate services um, in communities, sometimes we call it network adequacy in the healthcare um, sector. Um, so really putting higher expectation on the state and the managed care organizations, the Medicaid managed care organizations to make sure there is really um, accessible and adequate behavioral health service. Um, that won't happen just magically. We know that there are workforce challenges in the sector, um, but it sets a new expectation. And I know that that is, um, there's a lot of um, intersection between the work of homeless service agencies, um, housing agencies and behavioral health services. So um, I'll be real focused on the implementation of that. Um, on the policy front, looking forward to next session, um, we will continue to do work on, on renter protections. Um, and so there's a whole array of issues there um, related to, um, well, rent stabilization, right? The number one challenge we know people have is that the rent's too high. Um, that's true across the state. Um, but there are other things um, in addition. Um, some people can't get into housing because of um, their criminal histories. There's been a long time um, effort to try to um, provide some protections uh, for people to not be universally disexcluded from housing opportunities there. It's a very heavy lift politically, um, but the work on that continues. And actually our work on the drug possession bill helped to highlight um, what we often call the collateral damages of imposing um, criminal penalties on people. Um, and so I'm hoping there's a window of opportunity, but I'll say we need a lot more organizing around that issue. It's a very politically challenging issue in Olympia. Um, I'll also be working um, more on expanding those protections for um, harm reduction uh, services. And then I'm starting to hear uh, more about um, some challenges we're having at the local government level in the siting of homeless service programs. And so I'm really interested in um, seeing what we can do at the state level to make in some improvements there. Also really politically hard. Um, I've um, taken on a lot of um, conversations with cities who are reluctant or outright oppositional to citing homelessness uh, services. And so um, having a really strong organizing um, effort around that is going to be necessary for us to, to move in the right direction to improve safety and reduce harm to um, people experiencing homelessness um, in, in communities around the state. Thank you so much. That is um, that is a lot. I'm seeing a lot of places where the coalition and uh, coalition member agencies can um, collectively work both on implementation issues and um, and policy issues that we all see the um, harsh effects of in our day to day work. Um, 
Allison, did you want to, was there something you wanted to um, make sure that we cover before the end of our meeting? Thank you. Well, there's so much. Um, first of all, Rep Macri, thank you. Um, you. You started a sentence saying you've taken on a lot of hard, and then you said conversations with local jurisdictions that don't really want to cite things. But I was thinking really the sentence is, you've taken on a lot of hard things. Um, and I just wanna pause for a moment. And first of all, thank you. As you know, that is a core value as we've been discussing this morning of our organization. It's very hard when you work so hard on important legislation for years um, to keep in mind that sometimes it does take years to get fundamental changes like protecting tenants in a state where um, you know the law is really written to do the opposite. <laughs> um, and also we want to celebrate the, the real and significant changes, improvements, maybe not full victories. One of the things that I had a chance to just hear you speak about briefly in a meeting yesterday, Nicole, is your um, work with your colleagues, including Senator Saldana and many others, to make the kind of investment in contracts for homeless service and housing providers that is more than what we sometimes call nibbling around the edges. And I wonder if you could um, just briefly articulate what that is so that people can get a sense of, we often talk about the need to scale up things that work. And you know, we're in such a deficit, no one move is going to be big enough. And we know that, but what you helped accomplish is really big. Um, thank you for saying that. Well, I didn't, uh, you know, obviously didn't do it alone. And um, the, it's great to be a part of a, a team of um, folks who've been pushing to, to educate policymakers about what this work really looks like um, and what it really takes um, to do it well. Um, so last year, uh, I worked on this um, stipend um, program for uh, homeless service workers. Um, at first, uh, Department of Commerce said they an anticipated fewer than 2,000 people would apply and that we would probably spend um, no more than 10% of the funds budgeted. Well, we are on track to fully expend the $55 million that we appropriated um, for this. And we have had, um, last I heard, over 12,000 applicants across the state. We learned quite a lot about the diversity of um, homeless services happening, um, the venues that they're happening in, and the organization types. Um, that are delivering services to homeless neighbors um, in small towns and big cities across the state. So that's been great. The state has learned a lot more about the network um, of homeless services than, than we knew before. Um, I tried this year in my budget advocacy, and I'm so grateful to have an expanded team, especially with in the House with Representative Alvarado, um, also um, Representative Julio Cortez um, from the Everett area, um, Representative Mari Levitt from the Pierce County area, all of us work together to really push for more um, significant and sustainable funding in homelessness services with a real focus on supporting uh, workers, because this is a people helping people um, enterprise, and we know that we need to support the people doing the work. And so um, we fought for the first time ever for um, inflationary increases. So we budgeted for a six and a half percent increase um, over the base funding of homelessness services. We, we um, made permanent one-time COVID funds of about $111 million a biennium that was um, one time in the previous biennium. Now it's ongoing general fund. Um, we um, did um, some backfill on the shortfall for the document recording fee revenues and we included money as well for um to backfill some of the loss at the local level for document recording fees these are the filing fees um, on real estate transactions which is the primary revenue source for homelessness services and we also um made some significant increases to programs in the Office of Homeless Youth, including expanding our acre communities um, program, our homeless student stability program. And we um, um, made like a 25% increase to 
um, operations, maintenance, and services funding, and permanent supportive housing on top of the kind of inflationary increase on base services. So lots of um, important um, stuff. And it was really built on that work we did, that one-time kind of um, worker stabilization work that we did last year. Um, we have still have a long way to go. Um, our homelessness um, services uh, is are nowhere near uh, meeting the demand in our communities. And so I've really been trying to focus the conversation on what is the demand for um, housing and for short-term um, services uh, rather than um, where we are this year, which is we, my strategy really was on not losing ground um, and including inflation as part of that conversation of not losing ground. So that was the first time um, at the state level, but but we have a lot a long way to go and, and your advocacy has been essential to the gains that we've made. Thank you so much. We should we should learn that we need, you know, probably way more time, even though we tried to give the better part of an hour. But when you have folks like uh, Representative Macri, Senator Saldana, Representative Alvarado, and collectively extraordinary success, despite some really, really hard, not yet successes, um, <laughs> um, it's going to take a while. I will just um, say briefly, we're, we're almost at time. We're at time. I want to turn things back to Sarah and to Jody, make sure people register for the June meeting. Um, but also note to your to your point, Representative Macri, that we are, um, you know, we're we're working on a system that is just not scaled to meet the need, even remotely. Um, just this morning, breaking news: the White House has launched a six community initiative called All Inside, and has selected Seattle and King County as one of six. Uh, continuum of care sites locally to um, be part of collectively attempting to reduce unsheltered homelessness by 25% by 2025. Now, a couple of caveats. They're not deploying more resources. <laughs> they, they are not currently deploying more resources, right? Budgets are a thing. <laughs> but the um, but there is national attention. There is coordination across more than twenty government agencies at the federal level. There will be a federal person embedded locally. We hope to meet that person and bring them here. And just to let you know, I confirmed triple time because this was news to us as well. Although we knew there was some discussion about it, that when they say Seattle, they really, really mean Seattle and King County. I don't know why we can't get them to understand that it's not just Seattle, but at any rate, I want you to all to be aware of that. Um, the other communities are Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, the Phoenix metropolitan area, and the entire state of California. Um, so, you know, we work at multiple levels because we have to. Ultimately, the federal government does have massive resources to bring to bear, but um, it's not as easy as um, some of us might wish. Um, we want to note the fact that we had um, Shana Deitch from Senator Patty Murray's office on the call earlier. Really grateful to have her here. There's some advocacy at the federal level um, around TANF that we're going to be sharing with people. Um, but just to, to um, note that, you know, even as we are um, hearing about real significant progress at the state level, that is not only going to prevent us from moving backwards, but help us keep moving forwards. There is still and always so much more that we have to do. Um, there's a lot to absorb, so we'll be sharing some of this in written form as well. And um, back to you, Sarah, Jody, Tim. Well, thank you. I'm going to have us stop recording.